everybody. Welcome to the Long Distance Work Life Podcast. My name is Wayne Termel. We are here to help you navigate the stresses and strains and general craziness of remote and hybrid work. This is a Marissa-less episode because I am actually joined by a very, very smart guy with some important stuff to say. Uh, We are going to talk about empathetic conversations and the importance of that and how to hold them in a remote environment. And so I am going to introduce Robert Bogue to you. There's Robert. Hi, Robert. How are you? Hello. I'm well. I'm well. Thanks for having me. Uh, Thank you for being had. Uh, Like a minute. Uh, Who are you? What's your company? And then we'll get into the importance of this conversation. Uh, yeah, so uh, started my world as technology, 19 years as a Microsoft MVP, uh, do a lot of organizational change and how to help organizations communicate and collaborate more effectively. Uh, and I think what we're going to talk about today is part of the work that we do um, at Confident Change Management and the art of the empathetic conversation. There you go. Now, I think this is super important. And, and when I first started talking to people about remote work, I said that maybe the most important skill a leader can have in a remote environment is listening. And people would kind of look at me strangely because most people, in fact, don't know whether they're listening or not. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I think it's funny. I was going to say, you know, you know, I think it's funny because you, you've pointed out a key point, right, where we believe that we know how to communicate or we know how to listen. But if you go back to when have we been trained to do that, no one's ever been trained to do that. Yeah, we, we really haven't. And there is a difference between hearing and listening, right? Yep. My favorite example of this, and you and I have actually had this conversation. My favorite example of this is the word fine. Mm-hmm. And and I can't tell managers enough. Nothing is fine. Mm-hmm. How you doing? Fine. Yeah. Really? And if you are, if you have lived with another human being in a spousal arrangement for any length of time, you know better than to stop the conversation at "How are you? Fine," because nothing is fine. Right. Right. Yeah. Fine is your clue. I'm not going to directly tell you that you need to have a deeper conversation. But I'm signaling you, you need to have a deeper conversation. Yep. So we are going to get into the nuts and bolts of this. And I'm going to do a quick mood change very quickly. And then we'll return to the foolishness. Uh, Because while this is an important conversation and we've been having some lighthearted energy, your focus on this in the business world and, and becoming much more intentional about teaching and bringing people's yep. attention to this comes from a very serious place. And, and uh, if you would graciously share the story. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we've been doing this work, right? We've been doing change work. We've been doing communication work. We've been teaching people how to talk and listen, um, but not in a kind of focused and intentional way. Um, August of 2021, uh, we lost our son, to suicide. Um, and we kind of changed the focus and started looking at, well, what, what are the factors that lead to that outcome? Um, and I, and I'm kind of a systems guy and I'm like, how do we just rearrange the system so that we never have this outcome? And, um, what I know is that this wouldn't have helped Alex. It wouldn't have helped him. Um, that wasn't his story. But as I started hearing other people's stories and talked to the families, um, I started hearing that people who die by suicide didn't feel like they were listened to, that they were heard, that they were understood. Um, our son was in the military. And, you know, the military has a very interesting uh, belief about feelings and their non existence. And so I couldn't really open a c- empathetic conversation with the idea of, well, it's all going to be touchy feely because it just doesn't work. Um, And so we built this course around the idea that you can have this cognitive empathy, this understanding of someone else and not get wrapped up into their feelings and their drama and all the things that that 
certainly the military is concerned about, but also that uh, a, a lot of managers are worried about. If they get too deep with someone, they'll end up caught up in their feelings. And and so we built this as a way to, for people to feel heard and understood without that extra detail that isn't appropriate or necessary in, in a lot of contexts. And, you know, what we're talking about here, of course, applies anytime human beings talk to other Absolutely. human beings. But the remote component, the virtual component, does add a layer of complexity. I mean, one of the things that tortures me as somebody who um, advocates for remote work, but it's not like I'm a total evangelist, mm -hmm. uh, is during the COVID shutdown, almost two dozen kids in Clark County School District committed suicide. Yeah. Um, and isolation and lack of physical closeness right. and a lot of those things add up to it. So that being said, you know, the ability to really understand how people are doing and understand where they are is not always, you know, we're not always talking about that extreme. Right. But even yeah. if you're trying to get your project done, I mean, you need to know where people are. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's dual purpose, right? Like, so on the one hand, you're going to help people live, right? And that's a pretty nice thing. But it's, but, but it's actually, in most cases in business, it's the secondary effect. Great, I'm glad we get it. Uh, but the, the bigger primary effect that we're trying to get to is how do we work with other people to get things done? Uh, and you do that best when you know them. But, you know, one of the things that this remote world has done for us or to us is the velocity at which our contacts change is increasing. We deal with more people and they transition more readily, quickly, because the friction that we used to have of, well, I'm going to send Bob from Pittsburgh to, to Minneapolis no longer exists. You know, Bob, you're now on a team with Minneapolis and get on that Zoom call. Um, and, and so it's super important for us to not just deal with the mechanical pieces. You were talking a little bit about trust earlier, and that's super important. We we take for granted the fact that trust is, an, is a serious lubricant that allows us to work with other people. Um, so we've got, so, you know, so we've got this greater velocity. We have the, 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 the greater degree of, of change. And that means that we've got to get more effective at understanding other people and building that rapport. So let's, you know, dive down to this because you alluded to something earlier, which is the fear of getting caught up in other people's drama. Uh, emotions and drama yeah. and all of that good stuff. And I know as a manager, uh, you know, that's always a concern. And by the way, you know, an old cishet white guy manager <laughs> yeah. has had, you know, certain things programmed out of my social interaction toolkit. Right. Uh, so let's take it right back to it. The name of the course and, and the subject that we're talking about is empathetic conversations. Yeah. Um, you know, empathy is not really well understood, let alone demonstrated. No, which which is which is super cool because empathy at its basic core, like if you just break it down, it is understanding. That's really what it is. When when I say I'm being empathetic with someone, I'm saying I understand, and. I really can understand the two broad categories. I can understand the cognitive domain, the way that they think, the way that they process, the things that are valuable to them, or I can understand the affective domain, the, their feelings and and um, how they feel about things. And I think we, you know, we talk a little bit about both in the course, but we're very, very focused on the cognitive empathy because that's the thing that keeps you out of the weeds. It's the thing that keeps you out of trouble. Um, and it doesn't change whether someone feels heard and understood, right? Whether you're dealing with the feelings or you're dealing with, with the way that they think, you can do just the thinking and you can sort of sidestep the drama and the feelings and all of that stuff. And at the same time, have them feel connected with or understood. 
Now, run me through this idea of cognitive empathy, um, yep. because there's a part of me that understands this as I can em I, I can detect that you are upset. Yeah. But I don't have to get caught up in that, right? But the acknowledgement exactly. that you are upset <laughs> should di dictate how I interact with you at this right. point. Right. Yeah, and so some so so let me let me just pick anger because it's a super easy one. So if you look at if you look at Eastern philosophies, they'll tell you that anger is disappointment directed. Um, and so anger is a thing that most people deal with at some point in their in their professional careers. Um, when I encounter someone that's angry, I'm going to ask them what they're disappointed in. Now sometimes I have to cage that a little bit differently. The, the question can't always be that direct, but I'm really asking them what are you disappointed in because then I can start to unravel it. If anger as a feeling is difficult to process. We don't, we don't really have ways of processing our feelings well. But if I say disappointment, well, now you can say, well, I was disappointed in X because I expected Y. All right. Well, so there's two pieces here. One, Y is your expectation, and X is what you perceived happened. Now I can go, did X actually happen as you perceive it? And I can also look at why and go, is that expectation reasonable? Um, and then I can, and, and then I can close that gap. Now, am I really kind of moving into their anger and, and feeling their anger? No, I'm not. What I am is figuring out what are the drivers? What are the pieces? What are the components that, that led to that feeling? And how do I unwind that? Now I will tell you emotions move slower than cognition. So they can still be like, okay, yeah, I understand. And I'm still a little angry that's okay. Have them go do something else for a bit. <laughs> Eventually that'll come back down to where the, the cognitive state is. But it's those things where you can look at the, the mechanics, the perceptions, the, the reality of the situation and correct the misperception or the, the, the misalignment and get you back to a, a place where you can all work together and trust uh, that, that you're all being healthy. Wow, I love that. And I, I love when I hear we have somebody on our team named Guy Harris, who is brilliant because he is an engineer and he's able to apply engineering <laughs> concepts to this amorphous blob of stuff that is human emotion, right? Yes. And, and you just explained it brilliantly. I dig that. Um, so there's two things that come out of what you just said. Um, and maybe there's an a engineering explanation for this one, which is there is a tendency when you know that somebody is upset, mm -hmm. where the first thing you say is the least constructive thing you can say, which is calm down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's called the writing reflex, by the way. In psychology and in, in, in psychology backgrounds, it's called the writing reflex. And it is the desire to make someone else's experience look like yours. Uh, one of the things that we do in the middle of the course, we, well, just a brief bit, we teach uh, ethnographic interviewing, which is what anthropologists use to understand new cultures. We teach motivational interviewing, which I'm going to talk about more in a moment. It's primarily used with people with substance use disorder, and it allows them to make major changes in their lives. And then we teach dialogue mapping to bring all the parts of the system on together. Okay, so um, when we're when we're talking about um, this 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 process, right? I want to focus uh, the motivational uh, interviewing is engaging with the person, um, focusing on the right thing, and then we move to uh, evoking a desire for change, and then we we land uh, with planning and how do we how do we do that? Uh, so in the middle of the course, we're talking about this kind of this this vertical pillar of how do you uh, how do you interact and make change? OK, so uh, let's move on. So that's the beginning piece. And then you mentioned that from there, you know, it's motivated motivational interviewing and dialogue mapping. Tell yep. us a little more about that. Yeah, let me. Yeah, so let me. So let me bookend. I, I sort of gave you the middle piece and the and 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 getting to that. 
the, the start of that is the ethnographic interview. Um, I think one of the challenges we have, so you get a new person on your team and you're like, I don't know what to ask them, right? We ask the weather and, you know, the cat we see in the background walking across something, um, but really trying to understand, hey, tell me how you grew up. Tell me, tell me, tell me about the major parts of your world. Um, those are not questions we've ever really been taught to to ask. And, the, and that's what the ethnographic interview does. That's a framework that James Fradley first published back in the 1970s. Um, and it's just really good at getting you oriented with another human very quickly. The dialogue mapping bit, the bit on the back side of it, is really the idea that no person inter is, is uh, without relationships to other people. And this work came from urban planning, a guy by the name of Horst Riddle, who also was the guy that came up with the idea of a wicked problem. He came up with a grammar, uh, IBIS, and it is everything that you discuss in a, in a dialogue is either an idea, excuse me, either a question, an idea, a pro or a con. And when you start to visualize that, you put that up on a wall on a projector or share it via Zoom, people start to see that the way that we interpret comments are not consistent. I may say something and somebody thinks, oh, that's a pro, but really I meant that as a con. So when it gets coded, somebody has to check their understanding. Somebody has to go. I'm going to play dumb here. Can you give me yeah. a, a specific example of that? Yeah. So um, let's say that, well, we're trying to solve, we're, we're trying to, solve how do we improve communications among remote workers, right? That's the question. Then in that, an idea is that there is this concept around the empathetic conversation. Well, that's an idea. And a pro that might support that is there's a lot of really good research around the ethnographic interview, a component of it, and how it's effective at understanding other cultures, right? That's a so now we've moved from kind of big question, here's the idea, here's the thing that supports that. And, and we might say for a con, right? So we might say, well, there's that person on my team that makes no sense and is totally feeling, they have no logic whatsoever. You guys have all met them. Um, and how does this apply to them, right? And that might be a con. And then underneath that, we might talk about it. Well, here's an idea that all of us are feeling creatures and we're thinking creatures. And it could be that the thinking is suppressed. Okay, well, then the question might be, well, what, what would we do to, to make the thinking part come out, right? And so the whole conversation starts to evolve as this tree. And, and we get to uh, do this basic grammar check in our dialogue. Oh, I thought that was a pro. You mean that was a con? Oh, that was a question. I proposed it as an idea, but we really don't know that that's right. Um, and so that grammar and getting everybody on the same page is incredibly useful when you encounter situations that there's not consensus. And I know we have this all the time in business. It's, it's really difficult when people, so first of all, words aren't meaning. I should, I, I should say, I could say the word, um, weathered, right? So if I say the word weathered, Wayne, what do you think I mean when I say weathered? Uh, like a house or a wood or something that has been exposed to the elements and probably isn't the better for it. Yeah. So, so it's either exposure to weather or it's, or it's, it's, um, you know, having survived it, right? There's, there's all these variations. And when we get to some words, we can even get to words where the meanings are opposite, right? When we say by, that's one that's really very um, uh, uh, challenging as a prefix because sometimes we mean we're adding another one, so it's two. Sometimes it means we're cleaving one thing in half, right? And I've never understood biweekly versus semi-weekly. Like, I'm not sure I can, somebody can under, explain that to me. I'd love that because I, I always get it wrong. Um but, but words are not meaning. And so when we do dialogue mapping, we're trying to basically test the underlying assumptions that lead to the meanings that people are assigning to those words. Um, sometimes painful, but really very, very helpful at getting us to an end point. Yeah. And, and, you know, we can go down a 
great long rabbit hole about the idea that words matter more than we think they do. <laughs> we, yeah. Well, and it's the meaning that we apply to those words that man, matters even more. Right. Right. Like how many times have you said something as a compliment that your spouse has taken as not a compliment? Yes. Yeah. Right. Is, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Uh, in your personal relationships, how often we have learned these lessons and not applied them to the people with whom we work. Right. Right. Great. You, you, you used fine as this, the starting point of our conversation. Right. And so when somebody says, how are, you say, how are you doing? And they say, fine. And you move on, you plow through it. Like it didn't exist because you didn't want, you don't want to go there. You don't want to dive in. Well, part of that is because you don't know how to get out of it, right? If somebody says, fine, you're like, okay, that doesn't sound really good. Like, you did not sell that to me, right? And they can go, my dog died. Okay, let's talk about it for two minutes, and then let's move on. I think it's, it's, and it, this is where it gets to working remotely, and Lord knows we're almost out of, out of time already. Oh, yeah, but I, I think this is a valuable thing where people say, why do webcams matter? Well, if I'm on the phone with you and I'm, you know, my brain is going down the list of stuff I need to talk to yeah. you about and I'm doing the pleasantries to, <laughs> to yeah. get to the thing I really want to talk about. How's it going? Oh, fine. How, how are you? My brain says, fine. Check next, right. next box. If right. I'm on a webcam with you or the sound is good at least and you go, yeah. fine. Okay, right. I I should be picking up signals that you're probably not. Right. If all I'm doing is listening for the word, right, right. I mean that right. that's what we're talking about. Is being, yeah. In order to wrap this up for time, and we so need to have a larger conversation about this. If you want to start being better at this, right? <laughs> if you want to have yep. more empathetic conversations and, and you yep. know that this isn't your strength as a leader. What are one or two very practical, concrete things that you can, that one can do uh, to start becoming a more empathetic listener and having these conversations? Yeah. I mean, I think, so I think a couple of things, one, uh, don't worry about making mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. Uh, when we when we teach active listening, we're actually teaching active listening as a process by which you identify your mistakes collaboratively with the other person. Um, and so I think we we sometimes stop short because we we think, oh, my gosh, I don't want to make a mistake. Well, you're still making them. You're just not finding them. So let's go find them so that we can correct them. Um, and that that that's sort of an active listening. Uh, Chris Argus did a ladder of inference. It's a neat thing to go look up. Uh, and how you can use that to start to uh, understand people better, understand how they're interpreting what you're saying better. Um, there's certainly a lot of things that you can do about about understanding how trust is built. Um, safety, I know there's a lot of organizational uh, conversation about psychological safety in the workplace now. Um, these are things that if you just go look at, you become more aware of, and th being more aware of them creates a greater opportunity for you to understand others. Rob Bogue, thank you so, so much. We will have uh, links to the courses that we're talking about. We will have links to your organization and to you. Uh, just really, really important stuff. We will have those links on our uh, page at thelongdistanceworklife.com. Uh, please, please, please check that out. Uh, in the meantime, I am going to just tell you a couple of things. First of all, if you've enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. You know how podcasts work. We beg and plead, but it's really kind of important to help people find us. Uh, I am really excited. The third book in the Long Distance Work Life series, The Long Distance Team, is available now for pre-order and will, in fact, be available worldwide on February 27th, join us 
uh, for that. And you'll hear about some upcoming events around that. Finally, if you have questions, comments, vicious personal attacks, and want to speak to myself or Marissa, our email is here on the screen. Uh, LinkedIn, any way you want to reach out to us is terrific. And then finally, if you have questions about remote work and leading in a hybrid or remote environment, check out our free video series, uh, Demystifying Remote and Hybrid Work on longdistanceworklife.com. That is it for this week's episode. I know we ran a little long, but this conversation was so, so worth it and so important. Uh, I am going to mention that if you are in fact feeling isolated and not being heard, uh, please reach out. Uh, there are organizations and hotlines and, and people who are available to hear you. Uh, we urge you to take advantage of that. In the meantime, my name is Wayne Trammell. Thanks for joining us on the Long Distance Work Life. Have a terrific day and we will talk to you again soon.